So I've been reviewing handheld gaming PCs for some time now because I just see the potential in this form factor. It's kind of crazy how much progress we have made in just a few years, and I think the future looks bright for these kinds of devices. The Steam Deck is, of course, still the one to beat. If value is your main concern, then just get the Steam Deck. It is easily the best value in terms of price point to you know, what it offers in terms of power and its capabilities to play PC games and to emulate games and all that. But for those who do have some extra bucks to spend, there are some really cool alternatives. And I've got to say, chief among them is the Aya Neo 2 here, which I would say is among the more impressive devices in this form factor. It is really sleek. It is super portable. I love the way it feels. It's pretty powerful. And uh, it's one that I am kind of excited to talk about. So let's dive right in, starting with the hardware. You can already see that there's some LED lights glowing on the analog sticks, and that's something you can turn off or adjust, and uh, you can set your own custom color and uh, light patterns and whatnot. But in terms of holding the device itself, one of the things that I love is just how premium it feels. And just, I mean, turning the device around, you can see the sheen on it, and it's got this just really nice kind of shape to it. Beyond that, you've got these grips back here that really allow you to hold on to this device. Everything just fits really nicely in your hands. The rounded corners here means that the device fits really nicely. You don't feel any sort of pressure being applied to your palms or anything. There's a glossiness to it that makes it really sleek, but it's matte where the buttons and inputs are placed so you don't get too many smudges in this area. Really cool detailing, a really nice shape, a really cool device to hold and carry around and it's not too gaudy it's I, I like the subtlety especially this black color it's very stealthy it, it just i think it looks really nice i think it feels really nice you've got these analog sticks here these i freaking love these are hal effect joysticks and on top of the fact that you're not going to be experiencing drift on these analog sticks they feel so freaking smooth. They almost feel like they're floating and they feel almost frictionless. These are some of my favorite analog sticks that I've ever used, period. The D-pad here is also really awesome. What I would describe as tactile mushiness. It's soft to press, but you feel really confident in the direction that you're pressing in. There is just enough travel, just enough resistance. There's both a directional confidence and comfort in this D-pad. It's straight up one of the best D-pads I've used in any controller or handheld device. I really love this D-pad. The face buttons here are also pretty fantastic. They never feel like they're flimsy. It feels like it's placed in here really solidly and yet the resistance and the travel is just right. These are awesome face buttons. And just from that sound alone, you can really get a sense for how confident they feel to press. And then looking up here, we got the shoulder buttons and triggers. The shoulder buttons are nice and easy to press and they feel pretty tactile. Now, one of the issues that I had with the Aya Neo Air that I reviewed previously is that if you press these too softly or if you don't sort of really kind of push them down. Sometimes the button press wouldn't register. I didn't find having any of those issues with these shoulder buttons. They're pretty nice to press and comfortably situated. And then you've got these trigger buttons, which feel really nice and really smooth, but I do wish they had a bit more resistance, so it's easier to make those finer adjustments, say in like racing games. But generally, they have plenty of range of motion here. I do also wish that there was a bit of a damper so that the plastic smacking on plastic wouldn't sound so loud. It's literally the plastic button hitting this plastic groove, but, you know, these are still more than adequate triggers. The inputs in general of this device are honestly excellent. Beyond that, you've got the start and select buttons here. I do wish that the start and select buttons were situated here, so it's start and select instead of here, but it's something you get used to. What we have here instead are two buttons, so by default, this button will take you to desktop from whatever app you have open, and then this button right here will take you to the Aya space. So let me actually boot up the device and show you. Pressing this button lightly will bring up this toolbar here that will allow you to modify things like the volume, the brightness, the TDP, the amount of power you're drawing from the chips. That way you can customize how you want to balance power versus battery life. And then right here, you got some information about GPU and CPU usage. And then you got some fan settings. The fan, you can see, is audible. It does fade in the background. It's not terrible, but 
you will definitely be able to hear it during gaming sessions. And then down here, you've got the shortcuts. So for example, the shortcuts I've set here are mute. And then you've got this button here that is essentially Alt F4 to close any app that's open to close a game or whatever. Then this triggers the uh, mouse input. And so right now you can see that I am in keyboard and mouse mode. So you can see me dragging this mouse cursor around with the analog stick and different inputs will do different things. And then if you hold this button down, you'll bring up the IS space. You've got this home menu where you can see all of your installed games and easily access them. And then you've got the game section here that just shows you even more games. From the home menu, you can also modify various aspects that you can uh, engage with with the toolbar that pops up on the right if you just lightly tap it. And if you go to the assistant tab here, you'll find a number of different menus like this one right here that shows you some of the apps that you have installed. Then you've got this menu here, the hardware information where it'll just show you your system specs going back. You'll be able to see GPU, CPU usage, fan speed, Wi-Fi. It'll show you current RAM usage, how much SSD space has been taken up, the current fan speed, the battery life, among other things. So this is a nice little place to just check up on your device and what it's doing. Going back, you can see right here on the right, you can customize the shortcuts that I just showed you. This area here, you can customize all that via this menu i can go to that section on the right and add some kind of shortcut here you can see there are a variety of different functions that you can apply and then you've got these two menus the master controller and the configuration menu the i controller menu will take you to this interface where you can modify things like joystick sensitivity joystick zone the dead zones it is a little unintuitive it's hard to tell exactly what the difference between 50 percent 100 percent and 150 percent is because it's just not properly explained don't get me wrong when you play around with it you'll definitely notice a difference in analog stick responsiveness and just how sensitive it is how much faster the camera turns but uh, i just wish there was just better explanation and uh, just better adjustability. You can only really go from 50 to 100 to 150 percent. You can't go in between. So these are the only three options. Some refinements left to be done on this front. And then going back here, you can go to the trigger section and you can define the trigger sensitivity. Again, I wish it was more customizability. It's just 100% or 600%, nothing in between. At 600%, even the lightest touch of the analog triggers will activate the input. And you've got other things like being able to add turbo to any of these buttons here. You've got this custom menu where you can switch the ABXY configuration to be like Nintendo, where A is here and B is here, X is here, Y is here. And then going further down, you can modify what's called shock. It's just rumble. You can adjust the setting here from low to middle to high. The rumble on this device isn't great. It feels like a smartphone vibration. It just doesn't offer a whole lot of feedback, but it's there for those who are into that. Finally, you've got the gyro menu here that allows you to turn on the gyro and also define what button on the device will trigger it left shoulder or left trigger honestly by default this gyro just doesn't work you have to download third-party software and it takes a lot of finagling to get the gyro in this device working so i just unfortunately don't use it which kind of sucks because i'm actually someone who likes gyro controls and it works super well on the steam deck super easy to activate and have it work in games with these other devices it's just a little harder to get the gyro working so I just kind of opt to not even bother with it. All right, so let's head back out and go into this configure IA Neo menu. This is where you can modify things like shoulder key shortcuts. So beyond the shoulder buttons and the triggers, you've got these third uh, shoulder buttons that give you various functionalities. So for example, I've set it so that pressing this once will bring up the on-screen keyboard like so. Holding it will take me to task view and then going back here, this pressing this once on the left side is essentially the escape button and then holding it down will bring up the task manager that's how i've set it but you can customize it in this menu here and kind of set it to whatever you like for each of these respective buttons press versus hold so you've got four options four shortcuts and then going back from there we'll find things like the ability to recalibrate your analog sticks Right here, you can find the menu where you can modify the LED lights surrounding the analog sticks here. You've got the hotkeys menu here that allows you to set more shortcuts by pressing both the right trigger and shoulder buttons and then pressing the D-pad. And this is something you can turn on or off in case uh, you're playing a game where you might want to press both of these but don't want to activate a 
shortcut down here you can modify what this button here does currently it's set to show desktop i'm gonna keep it that way because it's a convenient button to have and then last but not least we got this button here that takes you to the back of the device and going in here you can modify the custom tdp there are four options for tdp in the toolbar here you've got game balance power saving and pro mode these are preset game is 22 watts balance is 15 watts and power saving is 11 watts you can go into pro mode here and essentially set your own custom tdp i've got it maxed out to 33 but you can go all the way down to three if you so desire or you can keep it at 33 to maximize the power of this device when it's plugged in so yeah, a lot of customization with is space here and this toolbar here is super handy for quick functions i do wish is space was just more refined you can tell the software is nowhere near as good as the steam Dex toolbar that has similar functions but just feels like it works better like don't get me wrong this works well enough to be helpful to be functional but uh, they're just aspects of the interface, the software stability that can occasionally be wonky, but it's better to have it than to not have it at all. So it's nice that it's there. And I can definitely feel the software improving over time with every new update, but it's just lagging behind compared to what the Steam Deck offers in terms of these similar types of functionalities. Now let's take a look at the rest of the device. On top, you've got two USB-C ports and you've got a third one on the bottom here. So you've got plenty of options when it comes to where you wanna charge, where you wanna plug in certain external devices. I love that there are three ports here. You've got the ventilation here. On the back, this is where the air comes in. This is where the air is expelled. And then right here, you've got volume rockers, volume up, volume down. And then you've got this power button that also serves as a fingerprint reader. You can see that it's super fast and it's worked really consistently for me, this fingerprint reader. So I'm really glad that this is here. And then let's see what else. On the bottom here, you've got this slot that if you open up, will reveal a compartment for the micro SD card, which I've got plugged in there. You've got the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and you've got the downwards firing speakers, which are not great. The speakers on this device are kind of teeny feeling. You can download this software right here called FX Sound that just kind of boosts the overall volume and the overall presence of the device's sound. But generally, these are just nowhere near the best speakers I have heard from devices like this. The Steam Deck is far superior, and Others like the, you know, like One X player and stuff like that just have better speakers, but you can always plug in a pair of headphones or earbuds, or you can connect via Bluetooth, whatever audio device you have. As for what the dimensions of this device are, one of the best things about this device is just how small it is for how powerful it is. It's not the smallest device ever, but I mean, just comparing it to the Steam Deck, you can see that there is a noticeable difference in size. The Steam Deck is a lot longer. It obviously has more functionalities like the trackpad and whatnot, but there's just something about holding this device that feels so comfortable and it is light enough. So the exact dimensions of the INEO 2 are 264.5 millimeters wide or 10.41 inches roughly wide. The height is 105.5 millimeters or roughly 4.15 inches. And then the depth, we're looking at 0.85 inches at its thinnest point and then roughly 1.42 inches at its thickest point, 21.5 millimeters versus 36.1 millimeters. And bringing in the Steam Deck again, you can see just what a difference there is in size, especially when it comes to length. When it comes to height, the Steam Deck is slightly taller. And then when it comes to thickness, it's actually like about the same in terms of the thinnest point, at least. You can see right here, it's really not that much different. And then when it comes to the thickest point right here, you can see it's not really that thick and it's comparable to the Steam Deck. The device is pretty lightweight too, coming in at 1.5 pounds, which is slightly more than the Steam Deck's 1.475 pounds. Feeling both, I mean, yeah, they're fairly comparable. What we're looking at here is definitely a more portable device compared to the Steam Deck. And this device is definitely more powerful as well. Let me actually go through the specs of this device. So this thing packs an AMD Ryzen 7 6800U CPU, a Radeon 680M GPU, 16 gigabytes of LPDDR5 RAM, up to 32 gigabytes, and it's got a one terabyte M.2 NVMe SSD built in, and combined with my one terabyte micro SD card that I've inserted here, 
we're looking at a combined storage of two terabytes. Now I think the Steam Deck has the right amount of power for the max resolution of 1280 by 800. This device goes all the way up to a 1900 by 1200 resolution IPS display that is actually really nice to look at. And I love the way the screen stretches from one edge to the other. It's almost bezel is and it's really colorful it's among the better ips screens that i've seen there's no backlight bleed on my unit though that will vary from unit to unit and yeah this is just a really attractive screen with colors that pop really nicely it gets pretty bright i do wish it was you know oled for that deeper contrast those deeper blacks but this will more than get the job done definitely among the better screens on a device like this. And the power of this device will actually allow you to take advantage of some of the high resolutions on this device beyond 1280 by 800. And I've definitely cranked up some games, even AAA games to high resolutions, and they just look really crisp on this screen. Now, while we're on the topic, let's actually talk about the performance of this device. I'm not gonna talk too much about less graphically intensive games because obviously those will run perfectly on this device. Instead, I'm gonna talk about some AAA games I tested on this, starting with Metal Gear Solid V: The Phantom Pain on high settings at 1900 by 1200 resolution. Even at those demanding settings, I was getting 50 to 60 frames per second average, and you can easily hit 60 frames per second if you lower the resolution a bit or lower some graphic settings here and there. Just really impressive performance. Control I set to low settings, but I boosted the resolution to 1440 by 900 and I was getting 45 to 60 frames per second average. Low 40s at worst when there were a lot of enemies and particle effects, but generally it was just really smooth gameplay at a higher resolution than what Steam Deck can achieve. Comparable performance to the Steam Deck at high resolution. Resident Evil 3 Remake, I was running on high settings with AMD FSR on quality. I was running at a 1440 by 900 resolution, and I was pretty much getting almost always 60 frames per second. Occasional dips into like 58, very negligible. Witcher 3, I applied the Nexion update, ran it on high settings with Hairworks and Ray Tracing turned off. Though with AMD FSR turned on and set to balance, at 1440 by 900 resolution, I was getting anywhere from 30 to 45 frames per second. Very playable, and the game just looked really pretty on this screen and on this device. Cyberpunk 2077, I set to medium to high settings, basically the Steam Deck settings with AMD FSR 2.1 turned on at a 45 frames per second target with a 50% to 100% resolution range. At 1280 by 800 resolution, I was getting 30 to 40 frames per second average. Playable enough and still the game looks really pretty, especially on this 8.4 inch screen with again, one of the better IPS screens I've used on a device like this. Elden Ring, I set to high settings, ran it at 1440 by 900 resolution. I was getting usually between 35 to 45 frames per second. This device handled Elden Ring super well. I can see myself doing an entire playthrough of Elden Ring on this portable device. Marvel Spider-Man I tried at medium settings with AMD FSR turned on with a 45 frames per second target. I boosted the resolution to 1440 by 900 and I was getting 35 to 45 frames per second average doing the most intensive task which is web slinging. And if I kind of roamed around the street, not web slinging, just kind of walking around, 40 to 50 frames per second average, really good results, very playable, looked really good to boot. And last but not least, I decided to try one of the newer games, Dead Space Remake. At high settings with AMD FSR turned on, at 1280 by 800 resolution, I was getting anywhere from 30 to 50 frames per second. The frame rate did fluctuate quite a bit with this game, but it was well within the range of playability. I did get some stuttering issues though. It was like, you know, the shaders loading kind of situation where when you're loading in new assets or when you walk into a new room, you'll get those micro stutters. So that's an issue that I encountered with this device, but it's still mighty impressive that you can play Dead Space Remake on a device that's this small and still have it look this good and have it run at high settings. It's very much a manageable way to play Dead Space Remake on the go. And the same goes for all these other AAA games that I got to test out. Just a really great gaming experience overall. Emulation fared really well on this device as well. I'm not going to cover less hardware intensive emulation like 3DS, PSP, GameCube, Wii, PS2, etc. Those will just run smoothly and beautifully on this device. Instead, I'm going to focus on Wii U and Switch emulation. Those tend to be pretty good benchmarks for these kinds of devices. So for Wii U emulation using the Simu emulator, I ran Zelda Breath of the Wild beautifully. I applied a 60 FPS mod and I was getting 40 to 60 frames per second average with frame rates usually sitting at 45 to 50 frames per second outdoors and 
it was almost always 60 frames per second indoors. And then when it comes to Switch emulation, running games on Ryu Jinx was just pretty much flawless. Mario Odyssey was running at a flawless 60 FPS. Kirby Forgotten Lands, I applied a 60 FPS mod, and I was running that game at 40 to 60 frames per second, depending on how busy things got on screen. A smoother, better experience than on the Switch proper. And I also got to try out Metroid Prime Remastered on this thing, just a flawless 60 frames per second experience. If emulation is your thing and you want something that's a little more portable and something that's attractive to carry around and hold and play with, the iNeo 2 is honestly one of the best devices out there for emulation. Now, there are a couple of flaws that I want to highlight about this device. Something that I experienced that you can't see now because I fixed it is the right trigger at one point almost like popped out of its socket. And when I try to press it, it would like be stuck here. It felt like there was just something inside that was interfering with my ability to press the button. It had to like, boom, like pop it inside, pop it back into its socket. And so, yeah, that's happened to me twice already. It hasn't happened to me recently, but the fact that this can pop out and I have to like forcibly pop it back in, that was a little disconcerting. And I don't know if that was the reason why I'm hearing something rattling inside this device. There is some kind of piece in there that's just rattling around inside the device. Sometimes it gets stuck on something. So right now, for example, I think it's stuck on something. So it stopped moving. But I don't know what, what that is. I don't think it's happened to everyone. I think it just might be an issue with my particular unit, hopefully. I don't see this as a common issue from other reviews that I've seen. Uh, but yeah, for my specific unit, maybe when I forcibly popped this trigger back in that was like stuck on something and I had to like put it back in its socket, maybe some slight piece of plastic broke off and now you're getting something rattling inside. I don't know, but uh, that's something unfortunate. I want to get that thing out of this device. I'll probably unscrew this thing at some point and uh, try to find the source of the rattling. But that's something that may happen. Just pointing that out, it happened to me. I don't know if it'll happen to you. It might just be isolated to my unit. But uh, yeah, it's just something worth pointing out because I experienced it. Another thing about this device is that when I put it to sleep, waking it up is not always a seamless experience. More often than not, it'll work. I'll just, you know, use the fingerprint scanner and boom, I'm right in. But other times, I'll like try to turn on the device, but the screen won't come on. And essentially, I have to like hard reboot the device. That's happened more than once for me to be able to get back into Windows and have the screen turn back on. So stuff like that makes it a less seamless experience to put this device to sleep and then wake it up. The Steam Deck was just always consistent when it comes to that functionality. Another flaw to this device is that the thermals aren't the best. The fan noise is audible, but is still manageable enough, but the heat dissipation, sometimes it gets pretty hot back here in the center, but some of that heat can kind of be felt at the tips of your finger here. It's not to the point where it's like painful or unmanageably uncomfortable, but it can be a little uncomfortable to feel that heat. And then one last thing worth pointing out is that this device does not have the best battery life. That goes true for a lot of these kinds of devices, especially as they get more powerful and the smaller they are, the smaller the battery. You're basically gonna get one to three hours of battery life depending on whether you're setting at, at the maximum 33 watts or whether you're setting at the minimum three to five watts. Uh, three hours is the most you're gonna get out of this device. So of course you can have a battery bank separately, plug it in, you can maybe potentially double or if you get a higher capacity, maybe even uh, triple the battery life. The battery life on this thing isn't great, but more often than not, I take this with me and keep it plugged in somewhere and I can just play games, PC, AAA games or emulated games on the go, set myself up in a stationary way where I have this device plugged in and that's fine. But if you want to have this device unplugged and play, you're not going to be playing your games for too long. You're going to want to keep it plugged in as much as possible. So that's one of the flaws of what is supposed to be, you know, a portable device. And then last but not least, let's talk about price and value. This is where the Steam Deck continues to be just the at the top of the game when it comes to these kinds of devices. Not only is the Steam Deck just a really solid, well-performing device with great support, the value, the price point is what's so compelling about it. The Aya Neo 2, it starts at $849 for the 512 gigabyte SSD and 16 gigabytes of RAM model. And it can go all the way up to a price point of $1349 for the 2 terabyte SSD and 32 gigabytes of RAM version. 
my unit right here which comes with one terabyte ssd storage and 16 gigabytes of ram this sits at a price point of one thousand one hundred dollars so a couple hundred dollars more expensive than the steam deck here whose most expensive version is six hundred and fifty dollars Though I will say that the $850 version of the iNeo 2 is not the worst value ever. It is $200 more expensive than the Steam Deck here, but keep in mind that this is more powerful hardware with the 6800U CPU and the 680M GPU. And the $850 version comes with the same amount of SSD storage, 512 gigabytes built in, and the same amount of RAM, 16 gigabytes. It is $200 more expensive, but you are getting a high resolution screen. You are getting more power out of this device. You are losing functionalities like the trackpad and whatnot, and you don't get that wonderful support that Steam Deck has from Valve and the Steam team. But uh, for $850, a more powerful version of the Steam Deck with a bigger, nicer screen. Honestly, we're closing the gap of value between what the Steam Deck offers and what these other devices offer. So I will say that the ION Neo 2 is a compelling enough value proposition that for those who do have the extra money to spend, who want to go above $650 or can go above $650 and are looking for other options, you know, this is a device worth looking at because it does offer some neat advantages compared to the Steam Deck with its smaller size, higher power, and uh, just these really nice inputs, the HAL effect sticks, the really nice inputs here, the D-pad and the shoulder buttons and the trigger buttons, some nice functionalities here, so these extra buttons, uh, and the fact that it's just natively running Windows, which might be easier for uh, some folks to navigate. And again, the games can run at higher resolution than on the Steam Deck and can potentially perform better than uh, on the Steam Deck. So honestly, for those who can spend a bit more money on a device like this, I wouldn't be against recommending the Aya Neo 2. Don't get me wrong, the Steam Deck is still king. It still has just the most comprehensive functionality. It's still the best value. It has the best support. And, you know, for those who live in the Steam ecosystem, there's just no better device than the Steam Deck. But this is, I'd say, a worthy enough competitor to give it consideration and to give it kudos. So for those who are looking into devices like this, I hope this was an informative video. I really loved using this device over the course of these past few weeks. Um, it's definitely a keeper. And I'd say among the ones that I've used so far, this is the closest to competing with the Steam Deck. But yeah, that's my take on the iNeo 2, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts and opinions are on this particular device based on what I relayed in this review. Share all of your thoughts and comments below. And to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.